Okay, let's get started. So today we're going to... I'm loud again. All right. I'll try to control my enthusiasm. But it's hard because we're going to talk about CSPs again. So today we're going to continue talking about CSPs. And in particular, we're going to talk about um, ways to solve them efficiently that extend and go beyond what we did in the last lecture. And we're also going to talk uh, about a related but, um, but more general topic of local search methods that apply not only to CSPs, but also to the other kinds of search problems that we've seen so far. So let's do a quick recap. Okay, we're going to do more solution solving of CSPs. So let's remind ourselves what a constraint satisfaction problem is. Well, first of all, what are the ingredients? First of all, there are variables. The variables usually represent some quantity or abstraction that we are trying to reason about. And so in our running example of map coloring, the variables uh, might be countries on a map. Each of those variables has a domain, which are the set of values that it might take on. And for map coloring, that was red, green, and blue. This is a great running example. It illustrates all kinds of things. But it's really important to remember that almost all CSPs are not map coloring. And almost all domains are not red, green, and blue. And almost all constraints are not inequality constraint. So you're going to see a lot of these, this example. But CSPs, arbitrary domains, arbitrary um, information hidden inside those constraints. So that's the variables, the domains, and the constraints. And when we talk about constraints in a CSP, they come in two flavors in terms of how we specify them. There's implicit constraints. And an implicit constraint is basically a little snippet of code that you run in order to tell you whether or not the variables in its input have an OK assignment. So remember, constraints look at a, uh, one or more variables and say, thumbs up to that assignment or thumbs down. That breaks one of the rules. Each constraint is a rule. So an implicit constraint is a snippet of code that you have to execute. That's great, because it's general. But it's bad in a couple ways, too. You have to actually have to run them to see what's going to happen. So there's a lot of sort of static analysis that you can't do pre-computation. And it can also be slower, because you often have to call out to these things in practice. The other form of constraints are explicit constraints. And in an explicit constraint, you actually literally enumerate for, say, these two variables that are being constrained. Here are the tuples that you're willing to allow. And so this is country A and this is country B. I could have an implicit piece of code that looks at the two values, runs equality, negates that, and then returns whatever. An explicit constraint would say, for A comma B, the legal tuples are red comma green, green comma blue, and so on, leaving out the illegal ones. So that's how you specify these. And in these constraint graphs, you kind of the line in the constraint graph is going to indicate the presence of a constraint between two variables. But that information of what's buried inside, you have to look that up in either an implicit or an explicit constraint. And the same idea is going to come back later with Bayes nets, where the graph structure will tell us what the dependencies are between the variables. But to actually know what the nature of those um, conditional probabilities are, we're going to have to look under the hood and see something that's not present in the graph. When we talk about constraints, they come in different arities. So a unary constraint is really just a restricted domain. It says, this country can only be red or green, for whatever reason. There are binary constraints. This is different from a binary domain. A variable with a binary domain is either true or false, or some other two values. But a binary constraint is a constraint that lives on top of two variables. And there are higher order constraints. You could have a three area constraint, a four area constraint, and in general, higher n area constraints. Some of the algorithms work with them, and some of them do not. What's the goal of a CSP? In this class, the goal is to find a solution. So when I present you with a CSP and say, please solve this, what I'm asking for is for you to produce an assignment of values from the domains to the variables that satisfies all of the constraints. So we're looking at find any solution. There are other things you could imagine doing with a CSP, like find me all the solutions. That might be bad news, because there might be exponentially many of them. Find me the best solution. Maybe there are some weights involved. Tell me whether or not there's any solution in which this node is green. These are all questions that you could ask of a CSP, but the algorithms we're talking about today and last class don't. Okay, they're just, give me a solution. As soon as you find one, stop. We had a basic algorithm, which we're going to extend and then find an alternative to today, called backtracking search. 
And we did a bunch of demos of these. Um, and basically, backtracking search takes a CSP, and it takes a search formulation of that CSP where the state of the search problem is a partial assignment. So at the top of that search tree is the empty assignment, where no, var no variables have any values. And then as you go down, the successor function in that search problem takes variables and adds a value. And so it extends the assignment. And then at the bottom of the tree are all the complete assignments in which every variable is assigned. So you can imagine there's this tree. And up here is the empty assignment. And down here are all the complete assignments. And of course, this tree doesn't look like this. It looks like this or something. Right? It gets exponentially big, exponentially fast. So um, although the actual implementation that we talk about is a recursive implementation, um, this is still depth-first search. And it's going to behaviorally act just like depth-first search from last week, where you could imagine that there is a fringe and you explore the deepest thing. That fringe isn't embodied in this code as an actual queue. It's embodied in the sort of the call trace. But it does the exact same thing. So what was this algorithm that we had? Well, if you have a complete assignment, great, you return it. Otherwise, you pick a variable. All right, that's the next variable you're going to assign as you work your way down the tree. And then you're going to loop over the values. So you pick a value. If that doesn't work out you're, and you recurse back, you're going to pick the next value. So you're going to have both the opportunity to choose what variable is next and the opportunity to choose what order to try the values in. And if the value is consistent, meaning adding it to the assignment does not yet break any constraints, then you're going to recurse and extend and extend. If it doesn't work, you're going to backtrack. So this was our basic backtracking search. It's not very fast. In general, CSPs, um, solving CSPs is an NP-hard endeavor. And that means whatever we do today, whatever cool algorithms we come up with, there's going to be some CSPs that are just going to be, to the best of our knowledge, really, really hard to solve. Okay, It is an NP-hard problem, but there are often instances which have certain properties uh, that allow us to solve them faster. So on top of that backtracking search, last time we talked about several general purpose ideas to improve things and to solve the CSP faster. So this is different than, for example, A star search, where the heuristic was specific to a single problem. I have my problem. I come up with a heuristic using my own creativity to figure out uh, what might be a good lower bound on the costs. These are general purpose ideas that will work for some CSPs, but not others. And when there are three classes, we talked about two of them last time, we're going to talk about the third one today. The first class of uh, ways to speed up a CSP is by uh, what's called filtering. And this is what we talked about last class. So we want, when we make an assignment, it may be that things look good so far. I haven't violated a constraint so far, but in some sense, this whole subtree of the search is doomed because there's an inevitable failure that's a consequence of the decisions I've already made. Filtering did that sort of propagation and look ahead to check to see whether there were consequences of the assignment that I just made. And we looked at forward checking, which isn't very good, um, and enforcing arc consistency, which is much better as a filtering mechanism. It's still not perfect, because these are still NP-hard problems, but it's a lot better than forward checking, though it comes with a computational cost. So that's filtering. Every time I make an assignment, I look ahead to see if there's any sort of doom on the horizon, and I backtrack if there is. Another way of speeding up CSPs in general were ordering methods. So asking questions like, which variable should I assign next as I do my recursive search? And there was an important distinction here, because you are eventually going to have to do every variable. right? You can't like luck out and not have to assign some of the variables. And since they're, you're going to have to do them all, there's going to be easy ones and hard ones, where we can make that formal by talking about how big their remaining domains are. You might as well do the difficult ones first. This is called fail-fast ordering. And this is so you work on the tricky parts of the CSP um, early so that when you backtrack, you're not buried deep in the tree and you don't have to backtrack across uh, exponential stuff and have to redo a whole lot of work. You want to do your backtracking um, early, locally, in a sort of tightly coupled way so that you figure things out and then move on to another part of the tree. So that was which variable should be next. Minimum remaining values is a proxy for the hard parts of the problem, and that's where you want to go first. When you pick variables, you sort of like charge right into the danger. But um, once you've picked a variable, you have to decide what order you're going to try the values. And this is a very, very different story, because you don't actually have to try all the values. If the first one you try works out, great. You don't have to try the rest. So we want to be sort of pessimistic when we pick a variable, but we want to be optimistic when we pick a value. So we're going to pick values that appear to be most promising. How the heck do you operationalize that? 
one way to operationalize that is what's called the least constraining value. It's a little tricky even to do this, and there are more complicated things people have come up with, but the idea here is you tentatively assign a value, you run some filtering, and you check to see whether um, elements are vanishing out of domains left and right, and if so, this is a constraining value. But if this assignment doesn't really impact anything else and leaves most of the domains intact, this is probably a value that's likely to work out. Not all the time. None of these are guaranteed to speed things up, um, but these are often very, very effective in practice, especially when you can combine them. The last thing that we're going to talk about today is how to exploit problem structure. That is, how to look at the graph structure of the constraint satisfaction problem and detect whether either there's a special purpose algorithm that might run faster than the general purpose ones, or maybe some way to improve the graph structure, and we'll talk about these kinds of techniques today. In order to do what we need to do today, we're going to have to extend uh, our discussion about arc consistency. So we're going to start with arc consistency, um, which you will remember is this idea that you look at a pair of variables. That's one variable uh, at the tail of the arc. That's the trunk of the car. And then it points to another variable. You are the arc consistency police. You will pull over that arc. You will check out all the values in the tail, and you'll delete them if necessary. And we'll do a couple more examples of this. That was the notion of making an arc consistent, and we use this to build forward checking, and we also use this to uh, do filtering based on enforcing arc consistency of an entire graph. We're going to do a third thing today. So let's first remind ourselves mechanically exactly what it is to enforce consistency of an arc versus a graph, because this distinction is going to be very important when we talk about tree structured and high, uh, uh, tree structured algorithms and consistency of higher orders. So let's do a quick example. Um, you'll remember we had this running example of the Australia coloring graph. Here we are. We are in our backtracking search. All kinds of filtering still have backtracking searches, right? The thing's still NP-hard. You're still, in the worst case, going to have to check everything. It's just after every step in the backtracking search, you filter some stuff uh, in the same way that at every step in A-star search, you run that heuristic. You might have to run the heuristic on every node in the state space. You might not actually gain anything, but you might gain quite a lot. So here we are in the middle of our backtracking search. So right now, this is the state we're in, where we've assigned Western Australia to red, Queensland to green, and remember, adjacent countries can't have the same color in this example. You will also see on the right here that we have an assignment to W, A, and Q, red and green, but we also have filtering running on the other variables. So the Northern Territory, New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia um, all have, they're all unassigned, but they have had, you know, zero to, to two of their um, domain values crossed off by previous filtering. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go around and visit arcs, making them consistent. So you're like, you're the arc consistency police, you're going to clean up any violations you find, and we're going to see what the consequences are. So for example, we might start with SARC. And remember, when we look at an arc, it's very myopic. You look at these two variables, and even worse, you look at them directionally. And you only look at, from, in this case, V, pointing to New South Wales. You say, in the tail, in V, is there anything here that is sort of doomed, guaranteed uh, to fail? Meaning there is no choice at New South Wales that can be assigned as an extension without violating a constraint. So we go through, and we say red at V, that's fine, because I'll choose blue at NSW. Green at V, that's fine. I can choose whatever I want at New South W. Um, blue at V, well, uh, that's fine, because I'll, uh, I'll choose red. So in this case, this arc is already consistent. I can look at other arcs. So here, SA to NSW, they also share a border. So I can look at SA and say, well, there's only one thing in its trunk, which is blue. Is there an extension to NSW that is legal? Yeah, red. Say, what about, what about blue? Well, blue's really about the other direction. So in this direction, the arc is consistent. Everything is fine. But if we visit the other direction, we might get a different answer. And so here, when we look at NSW pointing to SA, this arc is not consistent. And the reason it's not consistent is because if I pick red at NSW, I can extend that by choosing blue, my only choice, at SA. But if I pick blue, I'm toast because blue and blue conflict. And so the way I make this inconsistent arc, right, consistent, is I delete stuff from the tail until it's happy. And in this case, I delete that blue. And I can continue this. So remember, this arc was nice and consistent before, but that argument of its consistency was based on the presence of blue at NSW. 
Blue's gone. That means some of my reasoning from before needs to be re-reasoned. And so in particular, um, red used to be okay at V because I could pick blue at NSW. That's no longer okay, and I'm going to need to eject red here. Now the arc is consistent again. For any choice at V, there is a legal extension at NSW. Okay? So here's the interesting case, if you remember the example from before. The interesting case is between SA and NT. Neither has been assigned, yet we know from existing filtering that, if anything, they have to be blue. But they're adjacent. They can't both be blue. This arc is inconsistent. The only way to make it consistent is to start pulling things out of its trunk. I can delete that blue. But as soon as I do that, I have an empty domain. And as soon as you have an empty domain, you know that the CSP has no solution and you have to backtrack. Why? Because as we filter, we delete values and we have a sort of outer bound of what might be legal at that node, right? If you delete something, it's definitely illegal given the current assignment. But if something is present, it might still be illegal. You just can't really tell yet. But as soon as something's empty, there's no secret fourth color. We're going to backtrack. Okay, so that's our consistency of an arc. An arc is either consistent or not, and there's an algorithm, you can call it removing consistent or whatever, that makes it consistent. If you do a bunch of arcs in sort of the right, you basically do them to exhaustion, that is the algorithm AC3 for enforcing arc inconsistency and making the whole graph arc consistent. And as we saw here, you have to visit arcs over and over again. That's actually okay, because every time you visit it, it's because its head has fewer, no, fewer um, values in its domain than it did before, and so you can't visit it kind of an indefinite number of times. You can only visit it size of domain number of times. So our consistency detects failure earlier than forward checking. If X loses a value, all the neighbors incoming to X need to be rechecked. That can trigger cascades of, of uh, kind of repeated uh, visitation of arcs, but that's okay because it will all terminate. Another important thing to remember is after you do all this filtering, you're going to do an assignment and then you start the filtering again. So this isn't something you run once. This is something you run once for every single node in your search tree. We talked about limitations. We're going to address some of these limitations today, uh, though in two very different ways. After enforcing arc consistency, taking your graph, deleting things as necessary until all the arcs are consistent, you can be in a bunch of different states. You can have one solution left, and you can greedily assign, and everything will be great. You can have multiple solutions left. Um, for example, like the top graph here, where either one of the uh, either one of these. Uh, Nope, get back. There's two solutions here. One, one of them has to be blue, the other's green. It can go either way. You can also have no solutions left and not know it. We didn't talk about how to solve this yesterday, but we're going to talk about how to solve it today, um, or at least a way to think about it. And in this case, every pair of arcs is fine, but altogether, the three arcs aren't okay. Right? You need to look at triples. Arc consistency is only about pairs, and so you can't detect this problem. That's actually okay, because there's still a backtracking search, which will detect this problem instantly as soon as you assign one of the nodes. That's why our consistency still needs a backtracking search. Okay, that was our consistency. Any questions on that? Yes? Yeah, so why does our consistency sometimes detect failure earlier than forward checking? Remember, failure is when you see the consequence of your existing assignment um, is that some node you know has no legal assignments. The more arcs you check, the more likely you are to detect such a configuration. And in particular, in arc consistency, you sort of chain the information throughout the graph, and you can detect remote failures. Forward checking only detects failures that are right in front of you. And in fact, you were going to find them in the next step anyway, at least under certain orderings. So forward checking doesn't do a lot. It's sort of the minimum amount of filtering you need to be able to like, you know, flash your filtering badge and say, I do filtering, which is important because a lot of things like minimum remaining values require a filtering computation to even be defined. Okay? Our consistency is better. Let's talk about k-consistency. So our consistency is a really powerful notion which is basically the notion that for any two nodes in a graph, if you assign one, you can extend to the second. What happens at the third node? All bets are off. But at least for every pair of nodes, you're okay. It's a, we talked about our consistency as being like the CSP police pull you over and make some modification. 
Let's imagine instead of being pulled over by this little guy, you get pulled over by like mega Robocop here. Okay, that's the basic idea with K consistency, where instead of just enforcing that all arcs are following the rules, we're going to enforce that all uh, triples or quads are also following the rules. This is an expensive thing to do, but it is also powerful. And there's a trade-off between computation in the filtering and the amount of backtracking you're going to have to do. And there's no way to know in advance for sure for an arbitrary graph whether that trade-off will be in your favor. So k-consistency is a little bit of a mathy concept. I'm going to go over this now. We're going to talk about uh, sort of in general how to think about this kind of consistency. And then we're going to talk about specific algorithms that work for specific graph structures. OK. So the smallest kind of consistency is so silly, it's not worth talking about. It's one consistency. It's sometimes called node consistency. This says that every node's domain has at least one value that meets that node's constraints. This basically just means you enforce your unary constraints. And when you get a CSP, you can easily just enforce the unary constraints right off the bat once and be done with it. So one consistency we don't have to think too hard about. Two consistency. This is actually what arc consistency is, but I'm going to state it in a particularly weird way so that we can extend it to higher orders. Our consistency phrased this way says, for any pair of nodes, so I grab two nodes in my graph, if you have a consistent, meaning does not violate constraints, assignment to one, it can be extended to the other. Right? So that means for any assignment to the tail, there is an assignment to the head that extends that tail assignment without violating a constraint. And that's just what we talked about. Right? That's just what we talked about uh, all along here, which says, for any assignment in the tail, there's an extension to the head that doesn't violate a constraint. If you have that property, your graph is arc consistent. And then we had an algorithm for making it so. K consistency is a generalization of this. It says for each K nodes, so instead of picking up two, which is an arc, a pair, I pick up three or five or 30. K consistency says that if I have K nodes and I manage to assign K minus one of them without breaking any constraints, that there is guaranteed to be an extension to that kth node that does not violate any constraints. It says if you can get, through, get to k minus 1, you can get to k. So 2 said, if, our consistency says if you can get 1 assigned, you can get 2 assigned. We can talk about higher orders. As k goes up, this gets more and more expensive because you start talking about looking at not just pairs of domains, triples, quads, arbitrary numbers of domains. This gets exponential in k very fast. So higher k are more expensive. In this class, you only really need to know about k equals 2, which is our consistency. But these higher, the general idea of the higher orders are, uh, uh, are important. In particular, um, if you, uh, it, um, uh, in particular, so when I talk about consistency, it's sort of like mathematically a little weird because it assumes that you can get to k minus 1, but who says you actually can? There is a stronger notion called strong k consistency, which includes all the lower orders as a package deal. So if I say it's strong 5 consistent, that also means it's 1 consistent, 2 consistent, 3 consistent, and 4 consistent. So here's a claim, and then we'll talk about how this is useful or not. The claim is that you have strong n consistency, where you have n nodes in your graph, means you can solve without backtracking. Why is that true? Well, it's strong n consistency, which means if I pick up a node, we're 1 consistent. That means there's a value that I can assign that node sitting in its domain that will not violate constraints, which just means the unary constraint. Good. Lock it in. Okay, we're not going to backtrack. Pick up a second one, a second node. Well, there's an arc from the first node to the second node. And because that arc is too consistent, arc consistent, no matter what I picked at node number one, there's a legal extension to node number two. So pick one. Lock it in. Pick up the third node. Because it's three consistent, any assignment to the first two that has not violated a constraint can be extended to the third. So if you happen to have this sort of by induction, you can show that you can solve the entire thing without backtracking. This isn't super useful. I mean, it'd be great if we didn't have to backtrack, but why is this not super useful? How do you know this is not super useful? Well, you know this problem you're solving is NP-hard, right? This is an AI class. Everything's NP-hard, right? So since you can solve it very quickly without backtracking, establishing strong K consistency must have been really hard, and it is in general. But this basic idea that if you had the right kind of consistency, you could just kind of go forward extending without worrying about messing up your assignment so far uh, is actually at the core of an algorithm that we can run. It just doesn't work for arbitrary graphs. And we'll talk about that uh, really soon. So 
One consistency is free. Two consistency is, uh, is our consistency, and we have an algorithm for that. N consistency is intractable, but it would be awesome if we could get it. So there's this whole middle ground in between that you could imagine doing. In particular, three consistency has a name. It's called path consistency. You imagine three nodes form a line, form a path. By the time you get to four consistency, things are just getting really expensive. Any questions about any of that before we talk about structure, which will let us actually exploit these ideas to come up with algorithms that are guaranteed to be efficient? Yep. Um, uh, can I, are there examples of graphs that are in a state that are k-consistent but not strongly k-consistent? Yes, there are. Um, however, um, one thing that's important to kind of think through is what does two consistency, what does our consistency do? Like you just have your CSP, it's not our consistent. And you go and you like wave your our consistency wand and you make it our consistent. What has changed? Values have been deleted from domains at nodes. So like some domains that were kind of po fully populated, a bunch of them blink out. It's going to make an Avengers joke, but that might be a spoiler still. Um, what about three consistency? That's really tricky. Um, so when I enforce three consistency, what it says is that any two things can be extended to a third. And that means that what you leave in your wake when you wave your three consistency wand is actually not unary kind of shrinking, unary constraints. You leave binary constraints. So you introduce all kinds of constraints to the graph. So when you start talking about higher order constraints, uh, when you talk about higher order uh, K consistencies, you actually have trouble drawing these examples. So it's a little hard for me to throw in on the PowerPoint. Good office hours question, though. Let's talk about structure. All right. So you are, remember, the CSP detective, and it is your job to solve this giant CSP case. And you look at your nodes, and there's a whole bunch of them, and they're connected in this web of constraints. But then you see something. And so in this particular cartoon, you see there's the big boss in the center. And you have this intuition that we should be able to exploit this. We should somehow be able to, like, maybe you go after the one in the center, or maybe you start at the edges and, and work up. And this is the basic idea behind structure, is that just looking at the structure of the graph gives you um, ways to make the problem simpler if you can recognize certain syntactic patterns inside the CSP's graph itself. So let's start with an extreme case of exploiting structure. So remember... Uh, Remember the Australia graph here? There's, we, we keep forgetting about poor Tasmania. It's an island. But that's actually good for map coloring, right? Because it's an island. You can color it whatever you want. That's because it's an independent subproblem. And in general, if you're doing map coloring, the different continents or however things are separated on your, uh, on your map don't interact. And that means they're independent problems. You can solve them separately, and they don't interact, and there's no constraints between them. Independent subproblems are easily identified from the graph because you can look for connected components. How do you find that? You start at some node, you, you do a search, and you see what's reachable, um, kind of CS70 style. OK? So you can find the connected components of a graph. You can solve them independently. This is like incredibly powerful. If you have a big graph made out of a bunch of small independent components, it can make all the difference. So imagine we have some graph of n variables. So let's draw this. Here's this graph of n. Um, but it turns out you can break this thing into a bunch of little problems. We're going to hit the limit of my artistic ability. You can break this into a bunch of little problems where each one is of size C. OK, so instead of one giant thing of size N, you have a bunch of problems of size C. How many of them do you have? You have N divided by C of them. Looks a little bit like a Danish. Um, so how long is this going to, uh, how, what, how much work are we going to have to do to solve this thing? Well, CSPs, like, we have a lot of cool algorithms, but in the end, you basically have to be prepared to enumerate all of the assignments and check them all one by one. Like, that's what depth of our search is going to do if there's no solutions. You're going to sweep through the whole thing. It's going to check everything. You're going to backtrack until, like, millennia pass, and then it's going to say no solutions. So these things are pretty slow when there's no solutions if there's not some way to detect that easily. So in the worst case, well, we might have to do in the full problem, we would have to say, I'm going to assign all n variables, each of their d values. It's d to the n. It's exponential here. And as n grows, it's really bad news. OK? But in this Danish problem here, um, we only have little problems of d to the c. We just have a lot of those problems. 
And so if you kind of run the numbers, this is the difference between, say, n is 80 and d is 2 and c is 20, and you make some assumptions about how many assignments you can churn through per second. Um, that's like billions of years for the whole problem. That's not even a very big problem. Billions of years is a long time. But it's just less than a second under the same assumptions if you can divide it up into a bunch of independent problems. So independence is great. You solve the problem separately, divide and conquer. All right. How useful is this on a scale of 1 to 10? 0. 1. Why? You will never in your life run into a CSP that has independent problems because the whole point of posing a CSP is to say, here's a bunch of variables that interact, figure their interactions out. Often in the formulation of the problem, you've already broken up the independent subproblems. But it's a good mental exercise. And I guess in map coloring, it could really happen. And you could just not know it because you haven't done the analysis. But it's a good exercise to realize that the structure of the graph could shine light on ways to just solve it much, much faster. Okay. All right, let's look at some problem structures we can actually use. Um, one of the main ones is you can look at your graph and notice, not that it's in pieces, that almost never happens, but that it's sort of like not connected, it's not highly connected. So an extreme case of that is that it's a tree structure. So you look at your graph and you notice that there's a bunch of constraints, but the way they connect up the variables forms a tree. So here is a simple example of a six-node CSP that forms a tree. And there's a theorem, which we're going to show by giving an algorithm, that says that if the constraint graph has no loops, then the CSP can be solved in polynomial time. In particular, linear in the number of variables. That's way better than exponential in the number of variables. And again, there's this small term uh, where it's quadratic in the size of the domains. Okay. That's much better than the d to the n that you get in general. And it's not crazy to think you'll find graphs which are tree-structured or close to tree-structured. And we'll talk in a minute about how to take something that's almost a tree and treeify it, arborize it. I don't actually know what the word is, but you can do it, and then things are efficient. So this property is also going to apply when we talk about Bayes nets and probabilistic reasoning. It's sort of a deep example of how you can have syntactic or structural restrictions on your problem, which change the complexity of doing reasoning within that problem, even across different ways of uh, kind of, uh, uh, of posing um, the problem itself. Here's the algorithm for tree-structured CSPs. And we'll see how fast it is, and we'll see if it works. And if it's fast and it works, we will have proven our theorem. Okay? So step one, order. So you have your tree. You give it an order. That means you pick an arbitrary node to be the root, because these CSPs aren't directed to begin with. You pick a node to be the root. You pick the tree up by the node. You shake it like this. Pick it up by the ankle. This induces an ordering on everything else. That is the first node, and everything else follows according to the ordering along the topological ordering of the tree. There's not just one ordering, but it doesn't matter which one you pick. Just pick one. Linearize the thing. Okay? So here's a linearization of this, uh, of this graph. Notice everything's gone directed because it's now been linearized, and uh, I'm talking about the ordering here. So the underlying CSP is not ordered, but this directed linearization is, and it starts at A. I could have started at anywhere. The same algorithm would work just fine. Okay. So let's do an example. Um, let's imagine this was, again, uh, map coloring. And so all the constraints that you see are inequality constraints. Remember, in general, they won't be. And let's assume, perhaps because of unary constraints, that the colors that are shown here are the only ones that are allowed. Okay? And so we can take those domains, and we can sort of draw them underneath each of the nodes. So here A has to be, uh, has to be blue or red, B has to be green or blue, and so on. OK, so that's ordering. Here's the algorithm. Once you've ordered it, we do a backwards pass. So we start at f, and we go leftward. And for each node in this pass, we are going to make the arc pointing to that node consistent. OK, so let's do f. We're going to do f. That means the arc that points to f is d to f. OK, so we're looking at this arc right here. And we want to make it consistent. Maybe I should pick a color that's not one of my magic colors, like purple. And so I look at D to F. I pull it over. I look in the trunk. The trunk is at D. 
And I'm going to cross off anything in D which cannot be extended to F without violating a constraint. Red's okay, because I'll pick blue. Green's okay, blue is not. And so I will eliminate that, because that's what it means to run this remove inconsistent values. Next is E. I look at the arc that points to E, that's D to E, and I make it consistent. Is it consistent already? Let's look at it. Red works, I can pick anything I want. Green works because I can pick uh, blue. So that one's already consistent. Now I'll go to D. Incoming to D is the B to D arc. Is there anything that has to go or is it already consistent? Already consistent. Now we do C. B to C. Is there anything in there that needs to go? Now B to D left B untouched, but B to C will not because if you assign green at B, you have, don't have an extension to C, so we'll delete that there. So we processed C's incoming arc. Now we'll process B's incoming arc. That's the last one. We look at A to B, and we realize that blue is just does not have a future here. Okay? And, um, and, and, and now we've done this pass. Like, what has happened? Who knows what has happened? I've executed the algorithm as specified. I have removed inconsistent values going uh, from right to left. Now I kept saying things like, the arc pointing to F. How do I know there's not like seven arcs pointing to F? Let me add some arcs. How do I know there's not nodes somewhere pointing to F? Yep. Yeah, it's a tree. So this is the first time we've used the tree property is we know that there's gonna be one arc uh, pointing to each thing. All right, now it's time to do step two. Okay, we've pulled over everything. We've pulled everything out of the trunk. Our, uh, our arc consistencying phase is done, and now we get to do the fun part, which is assigning forward. So we're going to start at A, and we're just going to go on an assignment spree. We're just going to pick stuff that doesn't violate uh, our choices to date. So let's do it. For A, let's pick one of the remaining values. Easy choice. All right, B, we have to pick a remaining value. How do I know there even is one at B, right? I picked something at A. Maybe I picked the wrong thing at A. No worries, because A to B is arc consistent. That arc is consistent. And because A to B is a consistent arc, whatever I pick at A, there's something that's going to work out at B. doesn't mean everything's going to work out, but something's going to work out, and I'm going to pick one of the things that works out. Could I be messing up my whole future? Maybe. Let's not stress out about that yet. All right, time to pick C. I look at C and I say, is it guaranteed that I can take my existing assignment and extend it to C? Well, C's parent is B. I picked something at B. And B to C was consistent, which means whatever I pick at B, there is an extension to C. In this case, it's green. Okay, finally, there's one where there's actually a choice. So it's time to assign D. D has values. Will they all work out? We don't know. But we know we made an assignment at B. And we know because B to D was consistent, something at D is a legal extension. In fact, two things at D are legal extensions. Which one do I choose? Whatever you want. Who wants red? Who wants green? Well, that's surprisingly lopsided for green. Go green. Okay, so we're going to pick green. Oh, you're making it hard for me. That's why you want green. Okay, so now we go to D to E. And thank you, class. You made it hard. Um, so when I look at D to E... There are two values at E. One of them doesn't actually work, but D to E was consistent, which means even if I pick green at D, something is going to work. And in this case, the something is blue. And then when I get to F, I only have one choice, and because of consistency, it's fine. So it sure looked like in this case, I could go from left to right doing assignments, and I wouldn't have to backtrack. It doesn't mean I can choose like arbitrarily. I, there are still things here that won't work. It's just that as long as I consistently extend one step at a time, it seemed to work out. And that's going to be true in general. Runtime on this, I'm going step by step, left to right, uh, right to left, and then step by step, left to right. It's linear in N, right? There's no complication uh, in N. And then where's the D squared come from? That, that comes from the fact that whenever I visit an arc, I sort of have to look at sort of all the things in the head and all the things in the tail and check them against the constraint. And that all those pairs, there's D squared. Every time you see a D squared in CSPs, it's usually that you're doing some checking of a, a cross a cross-product of a domain. Okay, so there we are. 
Um, let's prove it. Let's prove that this works. So the claim is, after the backward pass, so remember we did, uh, we enforced the consistency of these arcs in a very sp- particular pattern. We didn't like, it wasn't like arc consistency for the whole graph where we do it and we do it again and again and again and again and again. Okay, we just did one pass. The claim is that after you do that, all root to leaf arcs are consistent. Okay, why is that? Well, each arc was made consistent at one point. We know that because we visited each one and when we visited it, it was consistent when we were done. It is entirely possible that after that point, we screwed things up. Okay, so for example, um, let's take... Uh, Let's take B to D here. We visited this arc when we processed D. We made it consistent. It was consistent for that brief moment in time. And then we did some computation. But all the computation we did was on this side, right? So what could make this arc that was once consistent? What could ruin it? What could ruin the beautiful consistency of B pointing to D? Well... Consistency says for everything in B, there's an extension to D. So deleting stuff from B is not going to make anything worse. That's just going to make our life easier. The problem comes if we delete stuff out of D. But we won't because we're headed in the other direction. So uh, provided we do them in this order, it'll be consistent when you make it when you visit the arc, and that consistency will never be messed up because we will never delete anything else from D. All right. Claim two. If root to leaf arcs, as we just saw that they are, are consistent, the forward assignment will not backtrack. Okay? Well, we're going to have to do an induction on position. Um, and I'm not going to do it. But, um, but let's look at kind of why it's true. So we assign something at A. We know we can extend it to B. Whatever we assign to B, we know we can ex- extend it to C here. And that's because each thing, whenever we go to some node, like let's say we go to, let's say we go to, to f here, right? It's parent to f, so d to f is consistent. Provided we've made it all the way up to d and e, whatever we did at d has a consistent extension to f, and therefore we can assign to f. That's the core of the induction. But like, how could this be, right? Why doesn't this work on an arbitrary graph? Where did I use the fact that this is a tree? Because all I really need to know to know that f is going to be okay is that um, whatever I assigned to D, because of the cons- consistency of D to F, whatever I assigned to D extends to F. Let's say it wasn't a tree. It's not a tree anymore. F has two parents. Still fine, right? Whatever I assign to D, there's an extension to F that doesn't break the constraints. And whatever I assigned to C, there's an extension to F. So I'm good, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Let me repeat that. So yes, I'm going to repeat it and modify it, uh, but it is exactly right. So yes, the consistency of these arcs tells me that whatever I assigned at D has an extension to F. Whatever I assigned at C has an extension to F, but there's no guarantee that they have an extension in common. So this consistency only lets me go without backtracking if there's only one parent, because if I had two parents, they might not have a joint extension. A joint extension would be three consistency uh, for two parents, and we don't have that. Okay, so for a tree, you only need our consistency. If you had more parents than that, you would need higher order consistency, and we don't have that. All right, so we just said why that is. And we'll see the same thing with Bayes' nets. There's an equivalent algorithm for tree structure Bayes' nets. All right, so we talked about two kinds of structure that are helpful. There is... Um, there is independent subproblems, which is extremely helpful and correspondingly rare. There's tree structured CSPs, which are not that rare, and they're still efficient. But most of the time, you don't have a tree either. You've got something that's like tree ish, right? And so most of exploiting structure is looking at the graph you have and figuring out if there's a good way to turn it into one of the efficient patterns. So we'll talk about two ways, um, and uh, two ways to do this. One way to deal with things that are nearly tree-structured is to make them tree-structured. And we do that by deleting nodes until the thing is tree-structured. How do we delete nodes? If we could delete nodes, we just start deleting nodes, right? So there's an algorithm called cut-set conditioning. Here's how it works. Conditioning in a CSP 
is when you instantiate a variable. So in this case, I can take my full CSP on the left. I can instantiate Southern Australia to some value, right? And it now has a particular value. As soon as I give it a value, I can then sort of consider its effect on its neighbor's domains. So maybe I assign it red. And that means there's going to be an impact on all of its neighbors as a consequence. But once I've assigned SA and I've seen its impact, the remaining problem looks like this and is now tree structured. Is it the same problem? No. Because I just assigned SA to red. In the main problem, the original problem, I didn't know what to assign SA to. So what we can do is we can pick a node and we can assign it, not once, but in every possible way, and then solve the residual graph. And any of those solutions concatenated with the cut sets assignment is a solution to the original problem. Why is this helpful? Well, let's imagine you don't just have SA here, but you've got a cut set of size C. There's going to be C nodes that we're going to delete from the graph by instantiating them. Well, when you instantiate them, you have to be prepared to instantiate them in all ways because you don't know which is going to be the one that leads to a solution. So if I want to delete C nodes, I have to do D to the C instantiations and solve D to the C residual graphs. Is that bad? It kind of depends on D and C, but mostly it's okay if C is small. Okay, so cut sets that are small can leave you, uh, can give you a fast algorithm if the residual graph, for example, is a tree or is independent. And so you can look at your graph and you can delete nodes until it's either independent or a tree or something you know how to handle efficiently. That problem is efficient, but you have to solve it over and over again once for every value of the cut set. You actually don't have to do every value because if the first value you try works, then you don't have to do the rest. Okay, so this is fast for small c. And so that means you ask questions like, great, can I find the smallest cut set that will turn my graph into a tree? Like MP hard, right? This is AI class. Everything we do is MP hard. But if you happen to have a cut set that's small that achieves this, you get speed up. So here's the algorithm. You actually already know the algorithm, but let's kind of lay it out. You choose a cut set. For In this case, you would a uh, good cut set choice would be SA because when you delete it, the residual graph is a tree. It's, in fact, a chain. You instantiate the cut set in all possible ways. So instead of having one problem, you now have three problems, or in general, D to the C problems. But if the residuals are really efficient, that's OK, because you compute the residual graphs, and then you solve them crazy fast with your special algorithm, like with the tree-structured algorithm. So you have more problems, but each one's simple. That's cut set conditioning. Quiz. I know I told you it was MP hard in general. But find the smallest cut set for the graph below. All right, how about this? Take a two-minute break, and when you're back, we'll begin with two letters.
Okay. Okay. Smallest cut set. I guess I need a quadratic clicker or something like that. Anybody want to throw something out? Okay, I heard some ABs. Who thinks AB? All right. That's at least the majority opinion. That's also correct. Okay, good. So if you delete AB, what's left? Well, remember, A's got a constraint against G, so like something will happen when you instantiate A on G. It'll like delete some values on, on G and so on. Um, but yeah, once you delete A and B, you're left with a nice uh, tree structure graph. Okay. It's kind of a trick question. I guess the smallest cut set is the empty set. But that is the smallest cut set that gives you a tree, so thanks for doing the pragmatics. All right. I'm going to tell you something uh, uh, a little more advanced that we're not going to go into as much depth or, or, or which you'll be as responsible for uh, on the, in the material um, that takes a little further this idea of how you can take something that's almost a tree and make it a tree. So cut set conditioning is a way. It's like delete nodes until you have a tree left. That is one way. But another way to do it is to do grouping, to look at your, uh, to look at your graph and say, it's almost a tree. Maybe there's nothing I want to delete, but I can sort of decompose it into something that is tree structured over larger variables. So the idea here is that we're going to create a tree structured graph, but it's not going to be the same variables. They're going to be mega variables. And the variables here are going to be little clumps or cliques of variables in the original graph. So each mega variable is going to encode part of the original CSP. And the sub-problems, um, the tree, the, the sort of outer CSP is going to be something that coordinates them. So for example, here's again our favorite example of map coloring in Australia. One thing I could notice is if I'm going to solve that whole graph with all of its inequality constraints, I also will have a solution to the smaller CSP, which just describes what's going on on the WA and TNSA nodes. Right? This is a little fragment of the graph. Right? So a solution to the whole thing is a solution to this. Another thing that I have to solve to solve the whole thing is I have to solve the NTSAQ region of the graph, and so on. So I can break this graph into little pieces and say, instead of solving the whole graph, I'll just solve the little pieces. Great, I have independent subproblems. I lied to you, they're all over the place. It's all tractable. So what's the problem with solving these things independently? Like, what's the problem with solving... Let's call this one, this, this one A and this one B. What's the problem with solving A and B separately? I'll give you A, I'll give you B. Yeah. yeah exactly. So uh, to repeat that back, if you solve them independently, the consistence may, the, the solutions to the subproblems may not actually be uh, coherent. So you might, in problem A, color the Northern Territories red, and in problem B, color it green. So you can't just solve them separately. You need to solve them separately subject to some constraints. It's going to get meta, right? So the constraints are going to say, do these subproblems, but make sure that any variables they have in common are assigned in the same way. So Here's mega variable one, which represents this part of the problem, and mega variable two represents the next and so on. These are going to have, these are going to be nodes. These nodes have domains, except what are the domains of a mega variable? It's the assignments to that mega variable, the legal ones. Well, what is that? That's like all the legal assignments to that piece of this, uh, of the CSP. It's going to be triples, which are okay, right? It's going to be an enumeration of the solutions to the subproblem. And then you go to M2, and it's going to have its solutions enumerated. And then there's going to be, for M3 and M4, these are the mega nodes. And then there's going to be constraints between them, which say they have to agree on shared variables. And that means that they're going to say things like, if they were explicit, they would say things like WA red, SA green, NTB, and NTB, SA green, Q, whatever, that that is okay, because it's consistent. Okay. And then if you solve this, you'll have a solution to the whole thing because each little piece is happy and they're all coherent, which means the whole thing is happy all at once and you have a solution. I more or less implied that this mega graph is now going to be a tree, but it's only going to be a tree if you set it up right. And we're not going to talk about the exact details. There's a property that pieces have to have so that it will be a tree and that consistency is actually guaranteed. 
And uh, it's called the running intersection property. And in particular, it has to be the case that, um, you know, say, if um, Victoria appears here and it appears here, it appears everywhere in between. So it can't sort of change its mind partway through. But, so, but provided you set this up in the right way, this mega problem can be efficiently solved, but it's efficiently solvable over variables that are very, very big. So again, there's no free lunch. But you can sort of push your lunch around the plate, as some of us like to do. All right, something totally different now. All of the things we talked about so far are ways of solving CSPs that basically boil down to search. And the search got smarter and smarter and smarter about look ahead in that search, that's what filtering was, and about sort of um, structuring the exploration, that's what ordering was, and so on. Um, iterative improvement is our first, uh, first, first time we're gonna see a randomized algorithm and it works in a very, very different way and actually generalizes to local search uh, methods in general. So local search, uh, iterative algorithms for CSPs is our first example of a local search. These methods work with complete states. It means rather than partial assignment, partial assignment, and then at the end, if you've survived that long, you have a complete assignment. An iterative algorithm starts with a complete state. For example, here is a two-node graph coloring problem with an inequality constraint where they have both been colored red. It is a complete assignment. It is not a legal one, but that's okay. Okay, local search methods don't necessarily have legal assignments, but they are complete. That's different than what we used to do, which was legal, but not necessarily complete. Now they're complete, but not necessarily legal. If we want to apply this kind of algorithm to a CSP, it works like this. You take an assignment with unsatisfied cons constraint. You're going to have operators. Instead of a successor function, which gives you the next state, you're going to have operators which reassign variable values. So you change the state in some way. It goes from one complete state to another. So it might go to this state. This state's a lot better. It's complete and it's legal. Okay. And these methods have no fringe. You live on the edge. There is no backup plan. Normally when you do search, there's a whole backup plan of all of these things you're going to try if your current plan A doesn't work out. That backup plan, that queue, the fringe can get exponentially large. Here it does not exist. You've got your current thing and you're going to keep tweaking it until it works or you give up. Okay. Here's the algorithm. While you have not solved the problem, in this case it's a CSP, so there's a notion of solution, you're going to pick a variable, and here you're going to select something that's conflicted. Don't mess with something that's already working. So you pick a variable that's conflicted, meaning it participates in a violated constraint. Then you're going to reassign its value. There's something called the minimum conflicts heuristic, which says choose a value that violates the fewest constraints. So sort of get rid of as, as, many, uh, as many conflicts as you can. Basically, this means hill climb on the function of the total number of violated constraints. So for four queens, for example, or an n-queens problem, you would have the queens just lying on the board in a bad state where everybody's threatening everybody else or whatever the random state you start with is. And the operators might be pick a queen and, and, and move it within that column or within that row. The goal test would be there's no attacks. And then the function you would use to kind of count the number of constraints violated might be the number of attacks. So that's it. Like that's the whole algorithm. Let's use. Let's see it run twice. Here it is running with n queens. Um, there it is. Okay, it's five queens now. Each of these queens. Here's the initial state. Each of these queens is conflicted. So I'm gonna pick a conflicted variable. Not the least conflicted one. Not the most one. Just pick one at random. I'll pick this one. And then you pick a minimum of conflicts, which in this case is to reassign it over here. This is my new state. It's a local search procedure. This is my only state. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to look at my successors informally, but I'm going to look at the ways I can modify this state, and I'm going to pick a conflicted variable, and I'm going to put it in a place that minimizes its conflicts. And then I'm going to pick a conflicted variable, and I'm going to put it in a place that minimizes conflicts, and I'm going to do it again. Oh, and actually I broke something, but that's okay, because I have no memory. I'm just going to keep doing this until now I solved it. That's it. Let's do it with, uh, okay, this was our map coloring example on the big problem. Remember, we did filtering to make sure we didn't mess anything up. You see all the domains. Let's switch to iterative improvement. Boom, complete assignment. It's terrible, right? Look at all those greens. It's not a good assignment, but it's complete. What am I going to do now? Instead of assigning new things, I'm going to pick up a node that participates in a, in a conflict, and I'm going to assign it in a way that minimizes its conflicts. So here's the next step. Okay, I reassigned that one. A conflict disappeared. One. That was step one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. 
seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Done. That's it. This works really well. Sometimes. Yep. Do you risk introducing a new conflict? Yep. Can this thing run forever? Yep. Will it give you an optimal solution if there are weights? Nope. Do you have any guarantee whatsoever? Nope. But it's very fast, very often. Okay. So, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's okay to feel have complex feelings about that. Um, all right. In practice, these things are really fast. Min conflicts. It's actually, sometimes it's amazing. So given a random initial state, you can solve, remember we were like, we can solve n queens of size 5, of size 20, of size 300 with these other methods. You can solve basically n queens of size anything with this method in basically constant time because you randomize it and most of the board is fine and you fix a couple problems and you're done. That's great. So far it's looking pretty good. There's going to be some bad news, right? Okay, let's hear some more news. Okay, it also seems to be true that for almost any randomly generated CSP, you can solve it instantly. Here's an important quantity, the ratio of number of constraints to number of variables, broadly speaking. If there's a lot of, if there's a lot of variables but almost no constraint, this ratio is small, and the, would you describe this problem as easy or hard? Tons of variables, no constraints. It's easy, right? Compared to the variables, there's barely any constraints at all. You just assign whatever you want, and therefore iterative improvement works great. Okay, so that's, that's, that's over here. What happens over here? Over here, there's just tons of constraints. The variables have constraints all over them. Is this easy or hard? Think. It's a trick question, so the answer must be easy. Why is this easy? Well, if you have a solution and there's constraints everywhere, there's probably not a lot of wiggle room, and it turns out that very quickly you can sort of chase, the, ch chase your solution down um, really quickly. Now, of course, there's this middle ground here where there's just sort of just the right balance of constraints and variables where it's hard to find solutions, but it's kind of hard to tell if you're on the wrong track. And there's this spike in how long you have to run these iterative improvement algorithms. So here's a map. There's this whole world of places where CSPs will be solved instantly. And then there's this bad area of hard problems where the critical ratio is sort of like the right balance where it's not over-constrained and not under-constrained. Okay. Is that good news? Where are you? Where is the problems that you see in daily life? Like right there. That's it. So it turns out that these, that this constraint for, for hard problems that we actually want to solve, very often you are in this bad ratio here. And Queens is a little weird because it's pretty under constrained. Okay, in summary, and then we're going to do the, uh, a quick intro to local search. In summary, CSP are a special kind of search problem. The states are partial assignments, and the goal test is defined by constraints. Because the goal test can be broken into pieces, we could smear that goal all the way through the backtracking search, and that gave us a faster way of using something like DFS to find solutions. We sped that up by being smart about the order that we attack the variables in the problem. We uh, sped it up by filtering and looking at the consequences of our assignments before we made the next assignment. Um, and then we sped it up by looking for or creating special structures within our CSP. Um, in order to have specialized algorithms or better performance from our existing algorithms. We also have an iterative algorithm called min conflicts that's very effective in practice for many uh, cases, though you have almost no guarantees. That's CSPs. We're going to talk about something very, very related that uses basically the same ideas. We're going to talk about local search here. You can think about local search as you're this robot. You are trying, you're in a mountain range, and you're trying to find the top, right? Because you're an optimizer. You're searching. You're trying to find the, the best solution here. So you want to go up there to that golden, uh, golden summit. But what does it look like to you? Well, you're a robot, and you can see about like this far ahead of you, so you go uphill. And you can see about this far ahead of you, and so you go uphill. And you go uphill, and you go uphill, and you get to here. And then what happens? You look around, and everything's downhill. You do your little victory dance, because as far as you can tell, you've just won. You say, what about this thing up here? What about that much better solution? Like, you have no idea that's there, right? In local search, you are, have an operating point. You look around you, and things either look like there's an uphill or they, there it isn't. And if there's uphill, you go uphill. So this is uh, iterative improvement was an example of that. 
more generally to phrase that, tree search keeps an unexplored, uh, a queue of unexplored alternatives, and that's what ensures completeness. The reason why things like breadth first search and A star and uniform cost and all of that are complete is because if what you're doing now doesn't work out, you've got this possibly exponentially large list of other things you're going to try one by one until finally something works, and in the worst case, you're going to try everything. Okay? So it's going to be complete. These algorithms tend to be complete, but they're going to be pretty slow because you're going to try everything uh, in the worst case. Local search, you start with a single option, you try to make it better, and when you can't make it better, you stop. Then what happens? You're done. Is it a good solution? Who knows, right? You're just done. So the new successor function now is that you make local changes to an existing state, and this is usually much faster and more memory efficient, but you have no guarantees. No completeness, no optimality. We talked about the general idea. Start wherever, move to the best neighboring state. If nothing's better than your current state, then you stop. We already talked about why it's bad. It's not complete, it's not optimal, but what's good about it is it's really easy to apply in a lot of problems. It's really fast to come up with a solution. Maybe a bad solution, but maybe that's okay. Depends on your problem. It'll at least be a better solution than the ones around it, so you can feel relatively good. So that's hill climbing. Here is basically the diagram of what your life can be like in cartoon when you hill climb. Why is this on cartoon? In general, any space we search is very large and very high dimensional. High dimensional spaces are very hard to visualize. They have all kinds of corners and high dimensional effects, and they definitely do not look like line drawings on a PowerPoint slide. But here's a line drawing on a PowerPoint slide. So schematically, you, you, you might be a, uh, you might be searching, here is your current state right here, and you look around and your operators might be nudged to the left or nudged to the right. Let me find another color. So you can, whoops, so you can go downhill, you can go uphill, and so at that current state, you'll go uphill and you'll go uphill again and go uphill again in hill climbing. And in general, you will stop when you get to a point that looks like this, where everything to your left and right, or whatever operators you have, is downhill. That's called a local maximum. You've almost certainly heard this technology, this terminology used informally. Up here is the global maximum. What is the sign that you have a local maximum instead of a global maximum? No sign. They look exactly the same, right? Only from looking from the outside or knowing something special or comparing two maxima can you tell that this is not, in fact, right? The, it's like you're climbing Mount Everest, right? You, like, you get to here, and you, like, you think you're done. You're not done. You've like, barely even started, but you can't tell from your local environment. Global maximum, local maximum. You can sometimes have these flat situations, either a flat local optimum or a shoulder, where things have leveled off, but they're not going to level off forever, but you can't tell. Right, this thing could go off to infinity as far as you know. This is what it looks like to be hill climbing. Here's a quiz. All right, starting from X, where do you end up? B, okay, I agree. Starting from Y, where's Y, there's Y. Where do you end up? D, that's sort of a bummer, right? Because you feel like you should like at least roll that's like, that's not a thing. That's, that's a metaphor that you might get from some combination of two dimensions in physics in a high dimensional space. There are notions of momentum where you keep trying things, uh, and you keep moving in directions that have been successful. So there are, I shouldn't say there's, there's no such thing, but, uh, in general, with simple hill climbing, you do just stop whenever you can't see which direction's uphill. Starting from Z, that's here. Where do you end up? E. Right? And how do you feel about that? Well, you feel about the same as when you stop at B. But if you had multiple restarts, and one stop to B and one start, start to stop to D, you can certainly tell them apart. And so that's why when people do local search, they often have many restarts running in parallel. A couple other ideas that are out there. Hill climbing is super powerful. Restarts on top of uh, uh, hill climbing where you start in a bunch of different places and you just sort of swarm. That's pretty powerful. Um, there are a couple other ideas that I'm just going to cover uh, very briefly the ideas. One is simulated kneeling you may have heard of. So simulated annealing basically says it's basically local search. It's designed for problems that look like this, where you're like, you're here, and you look around you, and hill climbing would say, to my left is downhill, to my right is downhill, I'm done. Simulated annealing is like hill climbing search with like a lot of caffeine. So it's going to like bounce around, and sometimes it's going to bounce out of these local optima. That's the core idea. Um, in particular, the algorithm goes like this. You start with an initial state, and then you do the following forever, right? You're never actually done. You just decide to shut it off at some point. Um, 
you get a temperature schedule. What's a temperature? A temperature is just a physics analogy, and there's some mathematics to back it up, but there's, it's a physics analogy. It has to do with how much you're bouncing around, and over time, you bounce around less. If your temperature hits zero, you just stop, okay? Otherwise, you look at a successor. So you randomly, so instead of picking the best successor, you just pick one at random, and you say, you, am I going to do it, or am I going to not do it? And then you look at the change in value, um, and you look at um, you look at the temperature, and so you compute the change in energy. And if it's better, you just do it, go in that random direction. But even if it's worse, you do it with some probability. And the probability you do it has to do with how much worse it is. The worse it is, the less likely you are going to do it. And the temperature, the hotter it is, the more likely you are to do it. And so at the beginning, you're just like moving around randomly. If the temperature is really high, you're just totally moving randomly. If the temperature is very low, you're doing hill climbing. And in between, you're hill climbing with some caffeine. And so you can often bounce your way out of little local optima. And that can be effective. Yep. Hmm? Oh, what, what is annealing about this? This has to do with a physics analogy of like metal cooling. I won't push the analogy on this or on genetic algorithms or neural nets or anything like that. They're techniques. They have math. Their names often come from some analogy to something else that I, in general, will not push too far. Um, amazingly, this, has a, uh, this is one of the few search processes that has a guarantee. It has a guarantee, a theoretical guarantee of optimality. Okay. So um, it basically says that if you decrease your temperature slowly enough, you will eventually converge to the optimal state. Okay, why is that? Well, it's a really interesting guarantee, right? Why is that? It says you're bouncing around, and you maybe bounce kind of less and less over time. What do you do when you're bouncing around? You get to this like good part of the state, and you bounce around, and eventually you bounce out of it, and you bounce in some less good part, and then you bounce back to the good part, and you bounce back to the less good part. And the higher the hill is, the more time you spend there in like the limit of infinity, right? You'll spend a lot of time there, you'll spend less time in the smaller hill, and the, and, and the taller the hill, the longer you're gonna be there. So if you run this thing forever, you, will actually, you can actually turn this into a guarantee of optimality. But, you know, it's not magic. In reality, that guarantee does not hold on any actual uh, finite time scale, um, and basically, it boils down to the more downhill steps you have to take to escape a local, uh, to escape a local optimum, the less likely you are to do them, all in a row. And so you're pretty much going to be stuck unless it's just like one downhill step or two and then you're escaped. So people think really hard not just about how to jitter around, but how to create what are called ridge operators, which let you jump around the space in better ways. One example of a very uh, extreme ridge operator, to give you an example of what it would mean to do not more, more than just jittering around, would be something like a genetic algorithm. There's a sort of an evolutionary metaphor here that... Uh, I won't, again, not push too far. It's really just a, a, a method here. Um, it uses a natural selection metaphor that has basically two parts. You have a bunch of candidates. They have fitness, right? But you're keeping a bunch of candidates, like a bunch of restarts. They have fitness, so you select some of them, and some of them duplicate because they're good, and some of them didn't get selected, and so the, the, they're off, they're gone. Um, and then of the pairs that are left, you do something called crossover, which is you take, this is the important part, you take partial hypotheses and you recombine them. So what would that mean for real? Well, it might mean something like this. I have two pretty good end queen solutions. Neither is actually a solution, but they both have a small number of conflicts. So I'm going to slice my board down the middle, and I'm going to take part of A and part of B and slam them together. <laughs> I feel like it's trying to tell me something. All right, let's restart now. Just kidding. Um, all right. So why does this make sense? Well, if you formulated the problem just right, your left quadrant and your right quadrant have sort of the right number of queens, and maybe kind of one's good on the left and one's good on the right, and when you smash them together, they'll work. Or maybe not. Maybe you'll get the worst of both, and you'll get some terrible thing with lots of conflicts. And so you do need to, have, to still do a bunch of search, which a bunch of restarts and a bunch of, a bunch of rounds of these. But this is an example of not just nudging your thing locally, but just taking entirely different ways of traversing the space, uh, which is why I bring it up. Okay. That's it for today. Next time we're going to talk about, or uh, you and Peter will talk about, adversarial search, which is how you think about planning forward in computation when not just you, but also other agents who are trying to ruin your day are taking action.